from the second lesson. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the year 1535, a rather serious-minded cleric from Gloucestershire was arrested in Antwerp and taken to Brussels to be locked up in prison. For over 10 years, he had been on the run, latterly pursued by secret agents who regarded him as Europe's public enemy number one. The charge against him was heresy, for which he was first strangled and then burnt at the stake. William Tyndall was to be Information Technology's first English martyr. His crime? To translate the Bible into English and to use the new technology of the printing press to disseminate God's word throughout Europe. Upstairs in our library here at St Paul's, we have one of the only three remaining copies of Tyndall's 1526 New Testament. It is probably this cathedral's most treasured possession. But soon after it was printed, the dean and chapter of this cathedral, together with the Bishop of London, were burning copies of Tyndall's Bible at St Paul's Cross, just behind me towards Cheapside. Tyndall had produced a Bible that even a ploughboy could understand, and this printed book was to change the political face of Europe forever. What made this revolution possible was the very latest in information technology. Less than a century before, a German goldsmith called Johannes Gutenberg had developed his famous printing press creating a mechanised assembly line process for the production of information. A monk sitting at a desk could, at the very best, produce a few pages of a book a day. The Gutenberg Press could produce 3,600 pages a day. And it is this technology that stood behind the great political transformation of Europe that we now call the Reformation. The pen is certainly mightier than the sword when it's backed up by the printing press. Now let's fast forward several hundred years. On Christmas Day in 1990, another studious Englishman, Tim Berners-Lee, made the first communication from one computer to another using the internet and hypertext, thus inventing the basis of the World Wide Web. This revolution in information technology was to make the printing press itself seem as slow as a monk at a desk. And like the political revolutions that were made possible by Gutenberg, the free distribution of information via the web is extremely threatening to many, not least political regimes that do not want their people to have the power of information or the stimulation of new ideas. Was ever thus, I suppose. And indeed, it is not overstating the significance of the present age to say that information technology is once again reshaping the deepest contours of our world. When freedom comes to places like Burma, North Korea, Iran, and it surely will, then it will have been information technology that made that freedom possible. Information is power, and with the latest in technology, information itself has been democratised. But with great power also comes great responsibility. And it would be probably remiss of me on occasion like this to duck some of the anxieties that many of us continue to have about the current revolution in information technology. What has happened to taking our time to make decisions? The hope was that information technology would set us free. The worry now is that it does quite the opposite. 
that it has the capacity to imprison us further in the ubiquity of work. Early this week, I spent a few days in the countryside, in green fields where there was no phone signal or internet connection. Once I would got over my initial trauma, I felt strangely liberated. And as technology increases, as we become more and more available to each other for instant comment and instant reaction, the more this need for time and for space will increase. This service is being tweeted live. Is this freedom or an information treadmill that we won't be able to find a way off? These are serious questions for your worshipful company to address. And of course, the other anxiety people have about modern information technology is that it's gradually replacing and subverting the human scale of communication. I guess this is a subspecies of a century-old worry about the dehumanising capacity of technology. That great Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas wrote that the human face of the other is the fundamental origin of all ethical obligation. Perhaps this is why so many chat rooms and internet communications can be grumpy and abusive. Without the direct human encounter with the face of another, our communication can become coarse and even destructive. I mention these things, but I will not dwell on them, for today is a day for celebrating achievement. This new charter is a right and proper recognition of IT's new status in the world and indeed here in the city. In 1523, before he was forced into exile, Tyndall went to London to seek the support of the then Bishop of London, Cuthbert Turnstall, in his new venture of printing the Bible in English. The bishop refused to give Tyndall his blessing, but the city of London did. A cloth merchant and alderman called Humphrey Monmouth recognised the importance of Tyndall's project and backed him financially. The city has long been a place that has supported the freedom of expression as well as the freedom of trade, and today's charter is another recognition of this most important link. Information technology is now the crucible of the global conversation of humankind. The promise that it holds out is that this conversation will bring us all greater understanding and through understanding, peace, freedom and shared prosperity. This is an awesome responsibility and you undertake it with the prayers and the support of this church. May God give you the strength and the wisdom to use the power that is in your hands for the good of all. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Amen.